All right, so I'm going to talk about a little niche topic called Proximate Nearest Neighbor Search, uh, something that, that came out of, I used to be at Spotify, uh, and uh, we built music recommendations, and I had to do this to scale it up and make it fast. Right now, I, I actually left Spotify about a year ago, so I'm the CTO of a company called Better, worked with mortgages, I'm based in New York, as I came down here for today. So uh, that's my story. Originally Swedish, but I started out in Spotify in Stockholm, spent about three years there, and then I spent about almost three years in New York. So and I, I built up the music recommendation machine learning team at New York, at, at Spotify New York. Cool. So let's talk about nearest neighbors. So what is it, right? We have a bunch of points in space. So let's generate a bunch of points. In this case, it's two-dimensional, so it's kind of basic, but you can imagine this going three-dimensional and four-dimensional, and typically what we did at Spotify was 40 to 100 dimensions. Uh, so, so the nearest neighbor is actually very basic, right? Like, you have a point, a query point here, and you want to find, like, what are the nearest points, right? Like, it, it's that simple. So, you know, you can expand and search for more. Uh, and so that's basically what it is. Like it's not more complicated than that. This is probably going to try to solve, but we're going to try to solve it in many more dimensions. And what's the point of that? So the point of that is that in a lot of domains, it turns out to be really convenient to take items and represent them as vectors, right? And so one of the things I did at Spotify was I took all the tracks in the world, or at least the, the tracks that we had, which was about 40 million, and use collaborative filtering, matrix factorization, et cetera, to, to make them into vectors. So now you have this like very tiny representation of what a music track is. You can do the same thing with users. And you can try to find like similar music by looking at like nearest points in the space. You can do user recommendations by looking at like here's Eric's point, like what are like music around this point. Uh, but there's also a lot of other stuff like Search engines, you know, computer vision, language processing, all kinds of stuff. Like vector models are, are, are very convenient in a lot of cases. OK. So here's an example. Uh, very basic, very classic uh, machine learning data set, the, the classic MNIST digit data set. It's, uh, a little louder, please. OK, sure. I'll, I'll try to be a little louder. I'll, I'll, let me know if you can't hear me. I'll, I'll switch the mic. So MNIST is. Uh, a data set of, uh, I think, uh, 100,000 digits, and they're all pixels. And so, so one way you can take these pictures and make them into vectors is basically, like, t let's take the bitmaps and just, like, flatten them into 784-dimensional vectors, right? And then you can define a distance function between these, uh, these digits by just looking at, like, pixel by pixel, what's the distance? Does that make sense? By the way, you should like totally interrupt me and like ask me questions if I'm like come up too fast and it's like weird, or if you disagree with anything. Okay, so so this is like super simple way to like take this an example where you can actually represent these digits as vectors, right? And you're doing it in a very like simple way. You're just like taking the bitmaps and flattening it. Uh, but it turns out it's already used, somewhat useful. Like you can do neighbors in this space. Like you can take bitmap and just look at like what are bitmaps that are fairly close to it. Um, and it kind of works. Except you see those like weird ones like here you have an eight, you know it's a five that sneaks in here. It's like screwing up the zeros and sixes. And it turns out that in a lot of cases you don't really have this like bitmap representation or like a convenient representation. And so my favorite machine learning trick is you start with some like high dimensional data, and then you like you embed it into a lower dimensional space, say hundred dimensions maybe, and now we have this hundred dimensional space that you can do convenient things with. Right? So we did that a lot at Spotify. We used matrix factorization to take this enormous matrix of what tracks have everyone listened to ever, and factor it down to small latent factors that are like 100 dimensions each, and now you can do cool stuff in that space. And it turns out that works in a lot of these different domains. So, so here's, a, here's an experiment. I, this is like something like a side project I had for like a, a couple of years ago. I, was, I downloaded like six million random pictures from, uh, from Yelp and Foursquare, 
and I, I, I train it to like classify food. The, the end goal was to like do like, I wanted to see if you can predict calories from food. It uh, didn't really work, and then I got busy with other stuff, so I abandoned the project. Um, but here's another way you can take things and make them small dimensional, right? So in this case, we're using a deep learning architecture, and we're trying to predict that this is like ramen or whatever, or should I go like an egg? And we have all these like uh, classes here that are basically like words in this uh, description from Yelp. But the trick here is we're introducing this bottleneck layer in this deep architecture, which forces the representation of each of these images down a 128 dimensional vector. Cool. So now we have a 128 dimensional projection that lets you basically take a hamburger and get a vector out of it. And, and now that you have this stuff in this space, you have this very convenient distance function, right? In this 128 dimensional space. Uh, you could do it on the bitmaps themselves, but the results probably wouldn't be that good. Um, by learning this embedding into this space, you can actually train a much better embedding. In this case, it actually learns to put hamburgers close to each other in this 128 dimensional space. Um, turns out, for various reasons, you want to normalize the vectors, which is so instead of Euclidean distance, we're using um, a cosine distance, but it, it's basically the same thing. Excellent. So, so now we can actually build a, 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 a search engine for food pictures, right? So you can look at you take a you take a food picture, and you can look at like what are the most similar food pictures, and um, in this case, fries, right? Like your friends, other fries. You can see that actually, what's cool about this deep learning approach is bitmap wise, they're actually not that similar, right? Like the, the white poles and, and this and this one, they're probably not aligned, but but the image learns to like embed. Or the, the, the network learns to embed various like Asian food with lots of white balls like close together in this 128 dimension space. Um, I think the coolest one is this. It's like various desserts that all have like chocolate and like green and yellow stuff on it. Uh, cool. So this is just one example out of many of how you can use uh, vector models. There's a lot of text NLP kind of stuff. There's some like classic models like TF-IDF, LSI. Um, I, I feel free to disagree, but I feel like there's this misconception that like word to vec introduced vector models for text, but it's actually a very old thing. There's been vector models for language processing like way back until like the 70s. Uh, and, and the idea of like taking words and sentences and putting them in a, in a, in a um, in a space, that, that idea is, is actually pretty old. And, and, and so, yeah, so, so here again, it's like basically the idea, right? Like we have this space, in this case, two dimensions. It turns out two dimensions is more convenient if you're using a projector. Um, it's also because we live in a three dimensional world. Uh, but yeah, you, you take words and you put them in space, right? Yeah. Collaborative filtering. I don't know if you remember Netflix price. It's been a it's been a while now, but a lot of the the winning models were based on various factor models, um, and, and this is quite cool. So, yeah. So 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 here's like some stuff that I worked on Spotify. It was a lot of like taking artists and tracks and embedding them in space, and then using cosine distance to figure out like what artists are very close. And you see that you know cosine is two back and two back is one because that's the definition of cosine. Like the angle is zero. You see other hip hop artists, it's like still pretty high cosine. But if you, look, you go across genres, like the, the cosine drops. Um, so, so this is, again, something I did in a much higher dimensional space with Spotify. Um, other stuff you can do, like geospatial stuff. This is a kind of fun side project I had like half a year ago. I just like pinged random IP addresses, addresses from my computer at home. And you know, now you have like points on a three-dimensional globe, but you can use basically k nearest regression. Um, another cool thing about uh, vector models is um, useful to like. Does everyone have, have you heard of like T T SNE? Has everyone heard of that? Okay, T SNE is, is kind of a cool thing that lets you take with 
high dimensional stuff and make it two dimensional is really useful for visualization. Um, there was a new paper that came out, visualizing large scale and high dimensional data, it came out like a few months ago. They actually use Annoy a lot in that paper. And it claims to be a little bit better than uh, TSNE. And I found this R implementation too. I've been talking a little bit to the author. It doesn't use Annoy, unfortunately. But the original paper uses Annoy a lot. OK, cool. So these are like all like interesting applications of vector models. Uh, and uh, I, I think in almost any domain, vector models are, are very convenient. But so, so let's talk a little bit about like, OK, so how do you how do you do this like search quickly? How do you do na nearest neighbor search in a high dimensional space quickly, right? Um, the baseline is obviously an exhaustive search, right? So if you have if you have 40 million tracks in a 100 dimensional space and you have the vector that represents the my music taste, you can also go through each of those like 40 million tracks and just see which ones are the closest to my vector, right? Kind of exhaustive like search, right? Um, but but that's obviously slow, right? It's going to be really slow. So we want to find something that's less than linear time. Ideally, some kind of logarithmic time, right? Um, Word to Vec has a brute force uh, brute force uh, uh, app that, or C program that comes with it. You can see it takes about two minutes to run for uh, their pre-trained vector data, uh, and then. And then, now let's see what happens if we introduce Annoy. So Annoy is the thing I built. So uh, you should check it out. It's built mostly in C++. It's actually not that complicated. It's about 500 lines of C++ and a little bit of Python. Um, there's other people have contributed R, Go, and Lua, the bindings. I actually just updated this slide because I did this presentation a few months ago, and it's gotten a lot more stars. Um, Sorry, I'm realizing I'm jumping around a little bit, but one of the cool things about Annoy is also that you can use mmap. Does anyone know what mmap is? Okay, so one person. So two, two people. So mmap is kind of a sidestep from what is nearest neighbor models, but mmap is this awesome system called in Linux that basically lets you take abused page cache and take a file on disk and map it straight into memory. And the cool thing about that is Multiple programs can actually share, multiple processes can actually share the same memory space. And so, and the other thing is you can load this memory space in, from disk in like basically no time. And so, Annoy uses that heavily. Uh, you can load an Annoy index in like zero seconds because it just like maps it from disk. And the other thing is like you want to use it across multiple processes, fine. Like let's just everyone map it from the disk. Uh, so, so, MF is a big thing. <coughs> The best. Choose it. Uh, okay, cool. So let's write a little annoy thing to to do this instead. So I took the. Do you know how many people know of word to vec? By the way. Okay. So there's a lot of people. That's great. So I, I took the pre-trained vectors and I built an annoy index, and then you can map it into, uh, into into memory and do the same query. Put in uh, Chinese river, and you get out. You get these these things. Uh, in, in only 470 milliseconds, right? So it's, it's a pretty drastic improvement. Now, no, no one probably noticed, but these results are actually slightly different. Okay, someone actually noticed. That's great. Uh, so these results are different because the A in Annoy stands for approximate. And there's actually a knob that you can tweak to, to decide how approximate you want it to be. So if we increase the search space a little bit, you can find these turn out to be the exact same as the exhaustive search, and but it runs in two seconds, right? So we went from a little bit more than two minutes down to two seconds, right? By not doing the exhaustive search, right? Cool. Excellent. Any questions so far? I'll keep going. Cool. So let's talk about how it normally works. Uh, and there's a few different ways you can do this uh, approximate nearest neighbor research. Uh, Annoy is uh, it uses an algorithm that basically I just came up with. It kind of seemed to make sense. So we're going to start with a set of points. Like the idea with this index is we want to build a data structure that lets us 
we want to build a data structure that lets us query for points that are close. Just like a database, right? Like the whole point of like a database is like you can add indexes. So you can like look up certain things very quickly, right? The whole point of a noise is you want to you want to build an index, a data structure, so that you can find you can query for like this vector here and like find the like, nearest points, right? So we want to build a data structure. And this is how we build the data structure. We split it in two halves, take the point set and we split it in two halves by a random vector. And then we recursively split, split those subspaces into random, uh, by random vectors. So now we have like a binary tree, right, with like four leaves. And we keep splitting, keep splitting, <clears throat> to finally you get this um, binary tree. I actually stop at some point. I stop when there's fewer than k uh, 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 items in each leaf, just because it's it, it's it's more memory efficient. Uh, so so it takes it's a little bit faster. Okay, so we split it, and now we have binary tree, right? Classic uh, computer science data structure. Excellent. Cool. So how do we search? Okay. So let's say we want to query for, you know, we have this white X here, and we want to find the, the points around this X that are the closest to it. Okay. So we can we can we can basically it's, it's pretty easy, right? We can basically traverse down the binary tree by just going on the right side of this each split, right? Okay. So that's what we're doing. We're gonna just go on this side first, and then we go down until we hit a leaf, right? And then we hit this one. If this is the leaf, no, this area here, but 10 points. OK. Does anyone see what the problem here is? So the problem is that this point here is included, but not a bunch of points here, right? So it turns out going on the right side of this random split all the time doesn't really work. Sometimes you need to go on the other side. So we have a problem, right? Like. We might have, the, and the problem is basically like in this original space, you might have two points that are very close, and then you pick a random hyperplane to split it, and you end up like splitting like right between them, right? So that's the problem. And so the solution is in a lot of cases, if the query point is close to the split, we just go to both sides. So we traverse down the binary tree on both sides. So we're actually going to go not just on this side, but we're also going to go down here. And now we expanded the search base a little bit. And we got a bunch more points. And, and so that's great. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And just that there's a few more tricks you can do. You can use a priority queue. You can uh, uh, do a little bit more efficiently. I'm going to go into that. Another trick you can do that is uh, pretty useful is instead of uh, doing one tree, instead of doing one binary tree and taking all these points and splitting them up, we actually use many trees, so forest, right? Uh, and uh, and we, we basically just like build each tree separately, just random splits, right? Now you can um, you can use all this is the same data set, but but different uh, different splits, different binary trees, right? You can you can like search each each of these binary trees individually, and then take the union of, of the points you find. Basically, you can, it turns out you can actually implement this. It, it, it sounds more complicated than this. You can just use a priority queue and search all these trees at the same time. And it's actually pretty, pretty uh, efficient. And so, so, so the cool thing with, with you know, if you use both a heap and a forest, it, it turns out to be pretty good. Uh, the, only, the only issue is like the more trees you have, the more uh, space this index will take. But it generally always gives better results. And so, so, so the basic query, the basic search algorithm is um, we're gonna we use a priority queue. We're gonna search for all, for all, all the trees until we found k items, and then we're gonna actually go through all these items, and we're gonna look like more closely what is the actual distance, and then we're gonna sort that in decreasing order and return. So, so here's the search algorithm again. First, we go through the binary trees until we hit a bunch of leaf nodes, right? So we're doing three trees here. And then we take the union of all these areas. Now we get this like weird polygon thing. 
And now we're taking all the points that we got in these leaves and we compute the distances, which is a more expensive operation because we need to actually, actually look at each point. And now we compute distances from maybe 50 points. We take the, you know, like top 10 points or whatever. Uh, you know, depends on. Excellent. Uh, any questions so far about searching? Yeah. When you, uh, how did you determine which ones of those paths were going down and later in the direction? So, yeah, so, so let's go back. Um, it's, it's nothing uh, strange um, where we were. So basically, like, you have this query point, right? So this query point, you basically, it just determines, like, first of all, like this split. Like, we just go down on the side at the query point. And then the second split is here, right? So we go on this side, right? So it's really just like every 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 intermediate node in this binary tree is a hyperplane, right? And a hyperplane has two sides. Like you can go on each side or the other side. So basically, just like you just have to compute a dot product with, with the hyperplane and the, and the query point, and then you see uh, which side of the hyperplane am I, and then you go through that. Does that make sense? In certain cases, I mean, every point, like for a hyperplane, every point is on either side, right? Unless it's exactly on the hyperplane. So that determines which side I'm going to go down first. But in a lot of cases, it turns out the point is so close to the plane that it's worth going to both sides. Okay. But if it's very far, if the plane is here and the point is here, like you just go down on this side, right? So, so in this case, like this is the first hyperplane, right? And a hyperplane in two dimensions is a line, like it's basic. Um, you know, a hyperplane in n dimensions is like n minus one. So, so in this case, the first split, we just go down on this side, right? And we actually never go on this side of the first split. Does it, does it make sense? So, so is there some sort of metric that tells you how far we go? Right, yeah, which is like very simple vector product. Yeah, because every every of these intermediate nodes are just vectors themselves plus an offset. Um, cool, so it's where were we? Uh, any other questions? How, how are you determining when uh, points to those two? Well, so I just use a priority queue. So I, I search by like increasing distances. So first, like, all the distances are negative because they're on the right side of the hyperplane. And then I start looking on the other side a little bit more. And then, and, and then it's just a matter of, like, how many, how much time do you want to spend searching? And, like, at some point, it's, like, it's good. Uh, so, so, that's, so that's why the priority queue is important. So, yeah? Is, is there a, so when you do the splitting, you say it's, ran, it's, it's random, right? Yeah. But can you, just from doing that rough, yeah, I think that's a really good point. And it's actually something I spent a little bit of time on. It's like you don't want to do it like really like completely randomly. And one thing that I've done now that seems to work pretty well, I mean it's all heuristics, but, but yeah. one thing that I do is like I sample like a few hundred points and do basically a, a k-means with two only two nodes, and I run that for like a few iterations. And that turns out to give. And, and the nice thing about that is like that roughly splits the point set and like two. Like it, it, it kind of it takes into consideration the shape of the data, right? Which you want to do because you're you're absolutely right. Like the problem otherwise is like you have this like thousand dimensional data set. You just pick a random vector. Like you probably like, you know, it turns out most of the data sets probably like it's spread out awesome. in like certain dimensions, but not other dimensions. So you, you kind of want to respect the distribution. On the other hand, because of the random tree construction, you would all, you still want it to be like somewhat random. So I, I, I don't know, but I tried a few different heuristics and there's like two memes approach seem to be vastly better than anything else. Yeah. I, I don't know if you can talk about performance, like, but it seems like you're uh, you're trading, uh, you're making search performance better, but then you're you're setting up this overhead of, of calculating the uh, splits and the mean trees. Is that generally correct? Right, but that's that's something you only need to do once because you build this data structure, 
Okay, so, uh, so it works best then if your data is static and you're searching multiple times. Right, which was the use case that Annoy was built for. So the use case for that we built Annoy for is we have this um, uh, 100 or 40 dimensional embedding of like 30 million Spotify tracks. And now we have like 300 million Spotify users that are all vectors. And for each of those users, we want to find what are the like top 100 tracks like that are like nearest to that user. And, and so yeah, so, so Annoy is not like, it's, it's, it's good for like static data sets. But it turns out building data sets is actually pretty quick. Uh, but you can't modify it once you, once you build it. Okay, cool. Let's move on to a different thing. I, I'll, I'll go through a little bit more quickly. Does anyone, has anyone heard of the idea, concept of cursive dimensionality? Okay, cool. So the idea of like cursive dimensionality is like, when you start getting into like high dimensional spaces, a lot of like intuitive things kind of break down. Um, like, like in basically like, so like in, in on, on a two dimensional, like the, the, the world is three dimensional, right? And like you help, you can, you can think of like the cities on the earth as like points, right? And like in, in, in three dimensions, cities are like, some cities are close, right? Like, New York and Philadelphia are pretty close. Like, I know that because I, I took the train this morning. And, like, New York and, like, Tokyo are really far, right? Right? It's, it's kind of obvious. But, like, what happens when you go to, like, thousand dimensions is that that completely breaks down. Like, suddenly, like, all cities are, like, equal in distance almost, right? If you just sample points on a thousand dimensional globe, basically, like, all those cities will have the same distance. It's, like, suddenly it's, like, it doesn't matter. Like, Philadelphia or Tokyo, like, it takes the same amount of time. And so, so, so this is what happened. And you can, you can draw some simulations of this. Like, if you actually draw random points in high dimensional spaces, you see that this happens, right? Like, in like one or two dimensional spaces, like the, the same, it's very different between the nearest and the furthest. But then you get to like thousand dimensions, and suddenly it's like they're all like, like so. So, why does this matter? It, the, the reason this matters is in thousand dimensions, if you want to do this efficiently, we, we still want to make sure there's some sort of local structure. But if all the points are like equally far from each other, like if you pick a hyperplane, it doesn't really matter. Like you're not really gaining that much information from splitting along a random hyperplane. So, so that's a big problem. Uh, and um, yeah, so in, in another way you can visualize this, this is called a, a Voronoi diagram. So it basically shows like the kind of drainage area for each of these points. And, and you can see that each point has a small amount of neighbors, right? In thousand dimensions, like all the points will be neighbors of all the points. So they're all gonna have borders. So you can imagine like, you know, uh, I don't know, like colonial era, but like in a thousand dimensional globe, how many like border conflicts there would be. Uh, and then you can, you can look at this, this, this ratio also and see that it goes to zero. Okay, but, but so, so an interesting thing that I that I've looked at a little bit is that it turns out this doesn't really like apply for various reasons. I don't know why, but you have this like theoretical notion of like um, cursive dimensionality. But it turns out even if you have these like high dimensional data sets, it turns out if you look if you compute this ratio, this ratio, it should go to zero, but it doesn't. So it turns out you have these like high-dimensional data sets, but they're actually behaving as they're kind of low-dimensional. So, and that's, that's, that's why I think Annoy works pretty well, even for like 500-dimensional data sets. It's because that the kind of intrinsic dimensionality is much lower. Um, cool, so that's what I want to say about cursed dimensionality. Yep. Is this effect, is everything you're using Euclidean distance, or is it independent of everything? Uh, I mean, the same phenomena, pops up in, I think, any distance, basically. I don't know about esoteric ones, but I'm sure, same thing. Um, yeah, so I don't know, I don't remember what this was about. Let's keep this. But uh, yeah, so another thing I've been working on is, is uh, there was no good benchmarks of like these approximate nearest neighbor models. So I built the benchmark suite, and um, for a little while, this was back in uh, last August or something, and I was among the fastest, and then I made a bunch of optimizations, and it was actually the fastest. Uh, and, and then a bunch of other people realized 
they're going to make their, their libraries much faster, so now it's this, right? It's like, it's not just like a bunch of other ones, but so noise is, is, is um, so there's a bunch of other that are, that are much faster. But I, I think it was kind of interesting, by just releasing this benchmark suite, first off, that it kind of spurred a bunch of random people in academia to work harder and improve their things. <laughs> so, so I, I, I think it's fun. I, I think it's like, I mean, it's just like, you know, Having like an objective kind of metric, it's, I think it's a great way to drive progress. And you know, too bad for me, it turned out that now all these other libraries are much faster than mine, but you know, I'm kind of a utilitarian point of view, it's fine. Um, yeah, so, so a few differences between these other things is like Annoy builds this, Annoy works with like random trees, right? And it's actually not the only way to, to build these, um, uh, to build an index and to do this and, and approximate nearest neighbor search, uh, you can also uh, build a, a graph. Turns out to be the, the faster. There's also a bunch of research on uh, locality sensitive hashing that a few libraries use. This is, is a different um, methodology. Uh, so I don't know. I, I think there's probably still a lot more to be figured out in this space. I think it's kind of an interesting space because people are starting to realize like vectors, they're, they're nice and they're useful. and so I still expect a lot of uh, cool stuff to, to, to come up. That's actually everything I have to say. And so, so the, here's a few links. You know, I have a blog. You can check out Annoy, go and start it, et cetera. Um, but that's it. So yeah, thanks a lot. Do you have any questions? Yep. Do you have any theories about why the person dimensionality is so different for real-world data versus I don't know. <laughs> so what occurs to me as a human like this is that maybe we're just not very good at reducing uh, to a thousand dimensions. So a lot of the dimensions are either irrelevant or redundant with each other or something like that. And if you choose ideal dimensions, you don't need for yourself. Yeah. I mean, like, one thing, I have multiple ways to think about that, but, like, one thing is, like, if you don't, you know, like eigenvalues, like they drop off, right? Like so, the, like first eigenvalue is like the biggest, or like single value the composition, right? So, so, so that's just like the value of like more dimensions kind of decreases. And so I think any like real value data set, I mean, if you do SVD on these like points drawn from like ran random Gaussians, like they're gonna have a pretty like uniform distribution. But if you take it from a real world data, I think, I, no. but if, I think if you take it from a real world data set, you're gonna see this like sharp drop off, where like a few dimensions explain most of the variation, right? I guess it's also like, I don't know, I mean, think about like word vectors, like, I don't know how, what are like the intrinsic thousand dimensionalities, but maybe it's like happy, sad, like cities, villages, like, like for any word, like it, it's, it's probably not, a, you can you probably don't want to describe it in more than like five other vectors. It's kind of sparsity there, I don't know. I don't know. Other questions? Yeah. Are you familiar with entries or R trees? Uh, am I familiar with M-trees? An R-trees, is that? No, I, I'm not. Okay, uh, well, so they're data structures for basically doing this kind of stuff. I was curious how they compare. Okay, I did most of it for like two dimensions and three dimensions. No, 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 no. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Cool, I'll, I'll take a look at it. M-trees and R-trees? Ball trees, I Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a great question. I, I should have spent some more time on this. So, so when I worked on matrix factorizations, while I was like collaborative filtering, it was it was, it was, it was it's, it's all like latent methods, and, this, and latent means or latent means like we're, we're discovering factors in the data set. So those factors may or may not represent, they may not correspond to like real world things, but usually they do. But we're not explicitly telling it to like, you know, go discover a pop factor and a, and a hip hop factor. Like we, we basically just give it a ton of listening data and, and run matrix factorization on it and let it discover structure in that data by itself. <laughs> so those factors, like the directions correspond to like real things, but that's not something we tell the algorithms to do. The input data is based on user references. The input data is based on, so you can either do it on like playlists, 
in this content, you can just like basically work it back. Or you can do it on, on uh, listening data, which is like, so you have this big matrix of like users and uh, tracks, and you can use this matrix factors. Very sparse, very big. Yep. Is the answer for your picture analysis essentially the same? For the food pictures? Uh, yeah. 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 In the bottom yeah. layer, yeah, it, it just like, I mean, it's just like kind of basically embedded in such a way that it discovers. It just, it's going to do, I train it on, I train it to predict words in the description of the, each image. So basically, it's going to like separate in 128 dimensions. Uh, like areas that correspond to words in the next layer. Not that makes any sense. So it's it's like a it's like a nice way you can like you can force and autoencoders work this way. You can you can uh, force a low dimensional embedding if you have some supervised data, like if you have some label data. You can learn a, a kind of an unsupervised representation by having a bottleneck layer. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 And you Yeah. 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 Yeah, I never looked at it out of four, but I think it's, I mean, it's like, yeah, like at some point that's an interesting, I'm sure Google has already sold this for like a million times larger data sets. It's a super smart way. Uh, I, I haven't done it. Yeah, I, I don't know. But yeah, it certainly sounds like an interesting research topic. Cool. How, how am I on time? Good. All right, I'll do like two or three more questions. Yeah. Yes, excellent question. So I had a director in summer of 2014, and he did a bunch of um, uh, deep learning on the audio. And you should read his um, you should read his uh, blog post. Uh, you can search for this deep learning blog post. I'm sure you find it. Uh, but it's really cool. And actually, what he did was he actually took the vectors we had from collaborate filtering, and then he took the audio and he, took, he built a deep neural network to like go from the audio to the vectors. Like so, so it's kind of a meta algorithm. Like you're predicting output from another algorithm, uh, and it actually works really well. And, and it's it's really cool what it ends up discovering. Like he had this like. 2048 dimensional uh, sparse representation of tracks, and it discovers like random things. Like there's like one of these like things dedicated to like Armin van Buren, and another one is like dedicated to like a certain chord, right? And it's kind of interesting. It is. <laughs> yeah, it even discovers like languages. Uh, yeah, actually, tomorrow I'm working on machine learning uh, meetup, and I know it's it's full anyway, so I think maybe I shouldn't say this, but there's actually going to be a presentation about roughly this. But I heart radio. Is gonna, but they're going to talk a lot about collaborative filtering and. Um, Audio analysis and, and in particular vector models. So it might be worth checking out this one. Savar and Mark. Cool. I'll do like one more question. That's it. All right. All right. Cool. Thanks.